Let us pray. Holy and faithful God, thank you, God, for taking care of us, your children, for walking with us through this, through these times, through this difficult valley of suffering and war and selfishness and unkindness as we celebrate the first coming of your son we thank you for keeping your promises we thank you for your faithfulness to your word for it gives us assurance that you will send Jesus back to bring victory to all of the people help me oh God to walk in the path that will bring me closer to you in the name of Jesus, son of Abraham, son of David, and your son, I pray. Amen. You know, last night, as I was trying to find my sleep so I could be rested for today, I, I turned on the TV and I saw, I saw a sketch in the Saturday Night Live. Uh, is that what it's called, Saturday Night Live? And then the, the comedian that been gone for a while, but the guy who plays uh, President Bush was back. Did anybody catch that? He was so funny. You know, he, was, he went through all, the, through all the candidates, right? He, he went through one candidate that I'm not going to mention. He said he is a, a red-haired Loompa Doompa. <laughs> then he, he talked about another one. He said, hey, I remind you that running this country is not brain surgery. And, and he went through all of them. And he was so funny, but behind that funny was, was you know, truths about these candidates. And it frightened me. It frightened me. And, and I, was so, I was so relieved that today is Joy Sunday, because I could just leave that fright behind. Leave that fright behind. But then as, I, as I'm coming here, I, I'm thinking, where did this year go? Where did it go? I mean, it, we were celebrating Easter last week. <laughs> and, and now in two weeks, it's going to be Christmas, right? And, but you know what? I, I, I like Christmas. I like Christmas because it's a time to remember to your, your childhood. It's, ta it's time to remember all those memories. And I, I have some wonderful memories of my childhood in Puerto Rico. Particularly on Three Kings Day, uh, we, we used to fill up a little shoebox with grass. And we would place a bowl of water next to the, next to the box for the camels that would bring us toys. And then we... I have, I have six siblings, so we were all sit around and I'd sleep waiting for them, for those camels with the, with the toys. And the grown-ups, my grandmothers and my parents would sit with us telling us the story of Mary and Joseph and the story of the three wise men who, who come bearing gifts for the baby Jesus, their king and for all the children in the world. And I, and I still get excited about those stories. I love those stories, and we tell them here in the church. And I, so I, I, you know, I'm thinking of, of the story of that, of that boy, a little boy, who came home from Sunday school and was so excited about the story he heard of the three wise men that he he, went, he ran home to share it with his grandparents. He said, he said, Grammy, I learned all about first Christmas today. There wasn't any Santa Claus back then. So these three guys on camels had to deliver all the toys. And Rudolph the red knobbed reindeer with his nose so bright wasn't there. So they had to have this big 
spotlight in the sky to find their way around. Cute story, real cute. But just like that cute story and what it shows us, Christmas has become a wrestling match between Santa and his red-nosed reindeer and baby Jesus. Everybody seems to be more interested in the guy in the red suit. I mean, you don't see anybody running to our driveway with their phones to take selfies with our display of the birth of baby Jesus. But yet, if you go across the street to the mall, and I'm not inviting you to go to the mall, if you observe what's happening over there, you see a long line of people trying to take their picture with Santa Claus. But let me paint another image for you, an image that beat Santa with all his elves and Rudolph the red nose reindeer any day. I'm talking about the image of God as a forgiving judge. God in Jesus as a saving king and warrior. God as a tender shepherd, risking it all to rescue a lost sheep. A God who rejoices when we show our love for him. A God who gives us all to whom we all. And you know, if you break the word Christmas into Christ Mass, in Spanish that means more Christ. But I don't see more Christ around us. What I see is more secular. Spend all you have, max up your credit card, and what you don't have to buy big people and little people stuff that they don't need, stuff that don't fit them, stuff that they don't even want. But there is no denying that it feels good. It feels good to see the happy faces of your family, your children, your friends, your coworkers, when you hand to them that gift that you spend so much careful time getting, that perfect gift. And traditionally, that feeling of happiness and joy is the focus of Advent. If you visit any church in, in this neighborhood or anywhere today, and no matter what language they speak, they are talking about alegría, gozo, joy, happiness. That will be their theme. But those preachers and I, we will not be talking about the anticipation of getting that commercial thing that, are, that, that is so aggressively being pushed by the Christmas ads on TV and on Facebook and Twitter and I don't know what else they have on those media that tries to inspire you to open up your wallet to buy that perfect gift. No. Today's sermon is about the joy and anticipation created by the coming birth of that perfect baby that will restore us to the seat reserved for us in the holy bus to New Jerusalem. The baby that will make it right between you and God, between me and God. I'm talking about the promise of restoration, prophecy in the Old Testament, in Zephaniah, and in the New Testament in Luke. But Joy Sunday is not only about our own elation. It is also about the delight of God who is deeply, and I mean deeply, invested in our lives 
and the life of the world. Our scripture says that God sings, that God shouts, that God rejoices. And we, the people, we, who are so wonderfully, amazingly, and inexplicably, God's beloved children join in that celebration in gratefulness for what he has done for you and for me. What God has done for us is what Advent is all about. That's what the Christmas celebration is all about. Zephaniah and Israel were inspired to acknowledge their appreciation of God by singing hallelujah. God be praised because God, Jehovah, had issued them a pardon and had voided the consequences of their disobedience. God has set aside the judgments against Judah and Jerusalem. He has set free what was left of the Israel nation. And that's what they were celebrating. They were celebrating that God is a God for the people. But earlier on, before leading the people into praise and worship, Zephaniah first reminds them of why they should be joyful and grateful. He reminds them of what they had done. Among all the other things that they had done, they had turned away from God and the ways of God. They worship other gods. They engage in violence, corruption, and fraud against their own community and others. They cease to place their faith in God. And Zephaniah reminds them of these things because he wants them to understand. He wanted us to understand the value of God's forgiveness, the greatness of God's pardon, and the mighty love of God. You see, when you forgive someone, you accept that they have done some harm, that they have done something to hurt you in some way. But often when we forgive someone, we go on resenting that person. In our hearts, we forgive. But in our minds, we continue to remember the hurt and who hurt us. And we act on it, even if we're not conscious of it. That's what that saying means when we say, when we say, I forgive, but I do not forget. And that's what we do. But that's not what God does. That's not what God did for us. Our God, our merciful God, forgives and pardons us. And let me give you an earthly example of the difference. When a state governor of, or the president of the United States grants a pardon, the slate is wiped clean. No record other than the pardon is left behind. When we grant someone the gift of a pardon, we learn from these scriptures that we should wipe the slate clean. Nothing should remain in our hearts of the hurt. We should move beyond remembering that we were once hurt. We should move beyond resentment. We should move to love and patience and respect. We should move to agape. God did that for Israel and for David, and that's what Zephaniah and the people were celebrating. And God, as I said, did that for us too. God sent Jesus to wash the slate clean with his own blood to free us from sin and from exile so that our relationship with God would be restored. It is only in the context of this fulfillment of God's promise that the miracle of Christmas should be understood and celebrated. And it is only in the light of what we celebrate in Advent that our Christian life makes any sense. The promise for Israel and the promise for the church in Jesus Christ is the essence of Advent, the reason for the season, like they say. And you know what? 
this is a promise that we are all invited into, wherever we may be, whatever we may be doing. It is a promise given as a gift to everyone by God who accepts the presence of Jesus in their lives. Listen to me. I am talking to you. I am talking to you, that person here who is mentally asking yourself. Me too? Is that promise for me too? Yes. Yes. You too are included in this promise. And you may be feeling the pangs of remorse and the memories of what you have done or what you haven't done yesterday or last week, last month, or maybe a bunch of years ago. That memory may be making you feel right now that you're not worthy. But I assure you that in God's eyes, your past is a dead issue. That in Christ, all is new. Even the calendar is new. We started year one, didn't we? As far as condemnation and guilt are concerned, God says, forget the past. Press on to what I have promised you. And if you accept God's promise, you can immediately stand upright as, you, as if you had never been lost. If you accept God's promise, you will find that his eternal purpose and plan for you were right where he planned them to be. If you accept this promise, a life of satisfaction, joy, usefulness in his kingdom is waiting for you. And what this means is that it doesn't matter who you are or what you have done. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, young or old, or your level of education. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor or if you're a, that, that reliable janitor that cleans the floor. Your resume is irrelevant to God. What is relevant to God is that you, that you seek him and that you show your gratefulness what he has done for you. And if you want to confirm that, what I'm saying, read Luke a little further than we read today. You will see for yourself that John the Baptist was preaching God's promise to everyone, to a wide range of people, some of whom were not the cream of the crop. Some of the people to whom John the Baptist was preaching were, were those on the margin of society, society. They were, they were the outcasts, the rejects. They were sinners. They were poor. They were, some of them were thieves. Some were cold-hearted tax collectors. The Bible is always mentioning the tax collector. But these people follow John. Why? Because they saw in John's message a bridge to God's promise. And they went for it. They went for it. And to help them, John shared with them what they should do to become fruitful, fruitful believers. And what John advised them to do is neither complex nor spiritually impossible. John, I call them John's rules of ethics. And John's rules of Christian ethics are very simple. Share. Be fair. Don't bully, and don't judge. And following these rules does not require that we shop till we drop on Black Friday or Cyber Monday. It does not even require that we change our lifestyles, but only that we think of others, at least during the season, when we ourselves receive the greatest gift that anyone can wish for. Amen. Amen. Do what you do, but do it better. Do it differently. Do it less selfishly. 
taking into account the needs of your family, your friends, your neighbors, your community. You see, in this society, and especially around this time of the year, we get used to getting whatever we want, whether we could afford it or not, and hoarding what we have acquired, habits that are not so easy to change. But change is possible. It may be easier said than done, but it's entirely within our reach. You know how they say that if you, if you smile, eventually you begin to feel happy. Start there, a very small step, but it's a good place to start your change. You may not even feel spiritual about it. You may, not, you may only feel a deep personal desire and need to make things better for yourself. Well, I can tell you that eventually the joy catches up to you. And who knows? Eventually you will feel like sharing that joy with others. And more importantly, you may even feel like sharing that joy with God. You may even begin to feel the wonderness of a faith in God that helps you through, helps you in good and it helps you through bad. And it doesn't even have to cost you a cent. Let me share this little story with you. A man named Reggie, not our Reggie Butler, some other man named Reggie. Reggie's brother, a banker, gave Reggie a car as a Christmas present. And on Christmas Eve, Reggie was coming out of his office, and he found a, a 10-year-old boy dressed in an old coat, admiring his shiny new car. Is this your car, mister? And Reggie answered the little boy, saying, yes. My brother gave it to me for Christmas. And the boy was surprised. You mean your brother gave it to you and it didn't cost you anything? Boy, I wish, and, and he said. And Reggie knew what he was going to wish. He was going to wish he had a brother just like the one that Reggie had. But what the little boy said was far beyond what Reggie expected. I wish the boy said, that I could be a brother like that. And for a few seconds, Reggie was, he couldn't find any words to say. And then on an impulse, he offered the little boy a ride. Would you like to ride in my new shiny car, Reggie asked him. And the boy's eyes lit up. And he said, yes, oh yes, oh yes, I would love that. And then they got in the car, and as Reggie was turning the car on, the little boy turned to him and said, Mister, would you mind driving in front of my house? And Reggie smiled to himself, because he figured that the boy wanted to show off to his friends and neighbors that he could ride home in this shiny, new, expensive car. But Reggie was, gone, was wrong again, as he found out. The boy, as they get to the, to the building, the boy says, will you stop where those steps are and wait for me? And then he ran up the steps, and Reggie waited. And after a little while, Reggie saw him coming back, walking very slowly, because this 10-year-old boy was carrying his little brother who was paralytic in his arms. And he walked slowly because the weight slowed him down. And the boy sat his little brother on the, on the, on the bottom step. And then he kind of squeezed next to him and put his arm around his shoulder, pointing to the car. There she is, Ben. Just like I told you upstairs, a shiny new car. And the man's brother gave it, 
gave it to him for Christmas, and it didn't cost him a cent. And someday, someday, Ben, I'm going to give you one just like it. Then you can see for yourself all the pretty things in the Christmas windows downtown that I have been talking to you about. And ready, again, without being able to speak, got out of the car and lifted up the, the little boy's brother and put him on the back seat of the car and invited the little boy to sit next to him. And the boy's eyes were gleaming with tears of joy. And the three of them took off on an extraordinary drive through the downtown streets, looking at all those wonderful Christmas windows. What a joy they all felt. And you see all three of these individuals experience that joy that day, and it didn't cost any of them a cent. And what I'm saying to you is that Advent is a perfect time to remind ourselves that our celebrations don't have to be about shopping and malls and websites and selfies next to Santa Claus. That faith doesn't have to be about big heroic acts and that we don't have to be perfect in order to be faithful and to show our faith to God and to others. I say Advent should be about remembering that the promise of hope and salvation exists and that we are invited to accept it. It should be about the joy of knowing that there is hope in change. I would say that it means that there is hope if we turn this holiday into one of giving instead of receiving. Into one of giving ourselves fully to God. Wrapping up our repentance in fine, beautiful, shiny faith paper and presenting it to God with praise in hallelujah as our gift. And lastly, one more thing. We think of joy as one-sided. We think of our joy. But it is not just we who are filled with joy when we worship and praise God and when we repent. Zephaniah says that God will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God will exalt over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. This is a powerful image. It is powerful because how often do we imagine God as one who rejoices and sings? Instead, we are used to the image of God as a judge, a punisher, a jealous shepherd guarding his flock. But yet here in our text today, we see God, and we see God's people alike, caught together up in a joy that overflows into song and joy, that springs from love, love renewed from a relationship restored. We rejoice because God has fulfilled his promise of forgiveness and restoration. God rejoices because we have accepted that promise. And when that happens, God's divine heart overflows with delight. It is moved and deeply affected by our attitudes and our actions because our God does not watch from a distance. He is not an absent God. He is everywhere in our lives and the life of the world. So much so that he became one of us in the mystery and wonder of the incarnation when baby Emmanuel was born from Mary's womb and was laid in the manger at Christmas. We sing praises and carols to God because his presence is with us once again. He is in our midst because he came to restore us 
to a right relationship with him and to reinstitute to us the privilege and benefits of his kingdom. We rejoice at what the birth of baby Jesus represents for us. His birth is the promise of being pardoned by God. His birth is the promise of the slave being clean. His birth is the promise of being washed thoroughly in our hearts and souls by the precious blood shed on the cross for you and for me. You too are part of that promise. Are you ready and willing to be a grateful recipient of that promise? Are you ready and willing to allow yourself to be transformed by that promise? Are you ready and willing to give God the freedom over your life? Are you ready and willing to give yourself permission to have God as the total uncompromising focus of your life? I pray that you are. Amen.